thank you for everyone that is here this morning. Lord, we have come to receive from you and to worship you and to thank you and to ask for your grace as we travel through the year 2019. As we lay the foundation in this month of January for all that you will do. Lord, we cannot lay the foundation by ourselves. The Bible says there is no other foundation that any man can lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you have laid the foundation yourself. All we are doing is building on that which you have laid. Lord, we ask this morning that you will speak to your people and your grace will be released afresh unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we receive strength for the journey in 2019 in the name of Jesus Christ. What you have never done before in our lives, begin it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let this year be very special unto us in the name of Jesus. Everyone who has been a part of this church, it doesn't matter for how long, even if you came in this morning, 2019 will be a year like you have never seen before in the name of Jesus Christ. It's your season to laugh in the name of Jesus. It's your season to celebrate in the name of Jesus Christ. It's your season for the more abundant life in the name of Jesus Christ. All your sorrows and tears are wiped away in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for answered prayer. Blessed be God forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Someone shout a better amen. Shout a big hallelujah. And welcome somebody to church this morning. and say welcome. I'm excited to see your beautiful face. Welcome to 2019. It's still not too early to say Happy New Year to you. Happy, Happy New Year. The Lord bless you for coming to church. And it will make this year phenomenally good for you in the name of Jesus Christ. It will be your year of the more abundant life as he has spoken concerning us in the name of Jesus. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'll read some verses there as quickly as I can. And I'll start from verse 25 to verse 27. Verse 25 to 27 in the first reading, and then I will read from verse 20 to 33 for my second reading. Luke 14, verse 25. Luke 14, verse 25. And if it's on the screen, you can follow if you don't have a Bible here. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned. Quite a lot of people were following Jesus here. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And these are words of Jesus that were penned down. A lot of people, just like we go to church today, great multitudes went to see Jesus. And in the course of talking to them, he turned and said, if you are following me and you do not have my love much more than you will have for your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, your sisters, even your own life, so you cannot even love your own life more than you love Jesus. So in everything, he comes first. If he's not the first place in your life, you are not his disciple. You cannot be his disciple. And he says, whosoever does not carry cross, so loving him is first place, carrying your cross and following after is what qualifies you to be his disciple. I read the second part of the scripture, which is Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 33. And I'm reading it from the New International Reader's Version. For the sake of making it as clean as possible, I don't want to read the King James Version, which has its own complexity in terms of understanding modern day language. But I'm reading from the New International Reader's Version. I hope they can find it. If they cannot find it, please just follow me as I read. It says, suppose someone wants to build a tower. Won't you sit down first and figure out how much it will cost? This is modern day language. Figure out. You won't find that in the Old Testament, in the Old King James. How can you figure something out? That's not, they, didn't, they, they were not speaking English like that in those days. But this is modern day. So won't you sit down first and figure out how much it will cost? Then he will see whether he has enough money to finish it. Clearly said, so that you can understand what the scripture is saying. Verse 29. Suppose he starts building and is not able to finish. Then everyone who sees what he has done will laugh at him. They will say, 
this fellow started to build, but he wasn't able to finish. Verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king, and suppose he has 10,000 men, while the other has 20,000 coming against him. Won't he first sit down and think about whether he can win? Verse 32. And when, and suppose he decides he can't win, he decides or he knows, he realizes he cannot win. Then he will send some men to ask how peace can be made with the stronger party. He will do this while the other king is still far away. Because if he has moved in, there will be no room for negotiation. He just runs into you and runs you over. Verse 33. He said, in the same way, you must give up everything you have. If you do not, you cannot be my disciple. You must give up everything you have. If you do not, you cannot be my disciple. I'm speaking to us this morning on a message I've titled, Counting the Cost. Counting the Cost. Counting the Cost. Jesus gave an analogy of someone who wants to build a house. It was a figurative speech for those of us who understand the bit of literature. You want to build a house? You want to build a life? You want to build your life? You want to be my disciple? Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is like building a house that will have a foundation. But in going into this, it says everything has to be costed. You have to do a costing from the beginning before you dive into whatever it is you want to do. And as I began to study the scripture, I saw that in Matthew chapter 5, same Jesus speaking there. Same Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. This is a scripture we know very well from verse 3 to 10. Jesus speaking there. Please follow me very closely. He said, blessed are they or the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Verse 4, he said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And you go on and on, up to verse 10. Jesus was saying, blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful. Verse 8, he said, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemaker. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for that is the kingdom of heaven. And that sermon on the mount, as it's called, sounds like a crossover night kind of sermon. Your life is going to be beautiful. Everything is going to be all right. Next year is going to be super. Everything will be good. You have money in your bank account that you'll not be able to count it. I remember that the general says tells us some of those type of prophecies sometimes. He says, a time is coming when, when you take your money to the bank, they will lock all the doors and they will be busy with your own money only and they are counting it. Somebody say amen to that. I mean, if you like that kind of prophecy. I mean, I mean, you like the money to be so plenty that when you come to bank, they lock the door and say, we used to hear those type of stories in Lagos. So, some, some people were circulating the news like that. One of those big Daroja, was it Daroja family in Lagos? They said the man will go to the banking hall in Saleko and then he will say, uh, I want to drink tea. And then they will lock all the door because he's the owner of about 90% of the money in that bank. He was just do whatever he likes. He's walking by the street and say, uh, banker, I hope you are still taking care of the money that I am keeping your custody. You know, that's how they live. But in the 21st century that we are now, eh, the bank will not close the door for you to count your money. Most likely, you have done it by transfer. Most likely, it's a check you have used. Or somebody has just done something or they use token. And the money is there. They don't have to do all the wala. Systems are talking to systems. The money is just there. And you are enjoying your money. That's the way it is now. In the days of old, they will bring carton, you know. Now it's POS machine or something like that. Even in church now, you see POS that they will put by the side. And you can put your money. The money will not make noise. You know? But in those days, it was money that made a lot of noise. Once somebody has money, you know, ah, this man. Because the moment he carries sacks upon sacks and is taking it to buy, they say, ah, this man has something. But things have changed. We are now figuring out how to do these things better than we used to do them. Somebody shout a big hallelujah. So, when Jesus gave that sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5, he was speaking to them like a crossover kind of service. Blessed are they. Blessed. blessed. In fact, he didn't go further to start breaking down. So, what do you need to do to be blessed in, those, in that Matthew chapter 5? He didn't break it down. But they were very excited because they all came to listen to him and he told them, blessed are you. And as I began to dig down to see the meaning of that word blessed, it's a Greek word that comes from a word that is called makarios, which means 
to be large, to be lengthy, to be fortunate, to be happy, to receive divine favor. Just like we preach divine favor today, we receive favor. That was the kind of message that he had in Matthew chapter 5. It got them to be excited about the message of the kingdom. But when you come to the Luke that we just read now, in Luke chapter 14, he came down to tell them that beyond the nice message of Matthew chapter 5, that is a sacrifice for being my disciple. It may not sound as lovely as be blessed. Receive favor. Receive big money in your bank account. He came down to drill down to what is most important for him at the end of the day. Matthew chapter 5 talks to us about what will happen to us in this world. How will this world be beautiful? How are we going to be happy? How are we going to receive favor? For whatever you do in this world, there is favor, there is abundant blessings. But far beyond that, how can you be the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you need? What is the cost of being my disciple? What does it mean? What, does, what is the meaning of the word cost? What does it mean? Let's try and look at that a little bit. What is the meaning of the word cost? Cost is the price for something. It is the value of a thing. It is the agreed value of a thing. The price to be paid or the price to pay to acquire, to produce, to accomplish or maintain a particular thing is a cost. Accountants know about cost. What does it what do you need to acquire something to produce or to accomplish or maintain a particular thing? There is the cost of a good accommodation. If you want to live in a good accommodation, there is a cost to it. You want to drive a luxurious car, there is a cost to it. What is the meaning of a cost? A cost is an outlay or an expenditure of money or time or labor or trouble that you have to go through to acquire a particular thing. Money, time, labor, trouble. Trouble is also part of the cost. What will the cost be to me to get a first-class education, for example, or a first-class ministry or career? There will be a lot of trouble. There will be a lot of laboring. There will be a lot of time investment. There will be money to be invested. Another definition of cost, it's a sacrifice to make. It's a sacrifice to make or a loss to suffer or a penalty to suffer because cost can also mean a loss. What do you need to lose to get something? To work at the cost of one's health. So in trying to create wealth, you can lose your health. When you're losing your health, that is the cost of gaining that wealth to you. If you live in an unsafe part of town and you want to live in a good place, you may have to sell the house that is big in that unsafe part of town to go and live in a small. So there is a cost. I mean, part of what you know about real estate, for those of you who know a bit about that, is that when you move into a very prime area of town, you may not have all the space you have in the village. For many of us who, in my village, for example, there is a lot. How much are they selling land? Not a lot of money. Maybe one land will be maximum, maybe 100,000 per, pl per plot or 150. For those who are very greedy, if they are not greedy, they will give you for almost 40 or 50,000 naira. You get one. So if they sell land for 40,000 naira, how many land, plots of land will you buy? If I, that's why people just build houses anyhow in their village. So some of you still build those type of houses, big, big houses. Because you are not paying for the land. But in Lagos, when you want to go and buy land in Victoria Land, one flat, Ikoyi flat, you know those Ikoyi flats, eh? You remember the story of Ikoyi flat and the plenty money there. Eh? How much is one flat? It's almost more expensive than some people's entire village. Because they just say one flat is 300 million. How many plus of land would that buy in my village? It, it buys the entire village. How much is the total land? The whole place is bought. 500 million is a lot of, it will buy the whole place. So, but for you to go and live there, what are you forfeiting? I forfeited what I can have access to there to belong to where the big people may want to stay. So, there is a cost. In fact, in economics, for those of us who read, you always hear about opportunity cost. You hear about the cost and the benefit of something. Because if there is no cost, there will be no benefit. If there is a benefit, there is a cost that comes with that benefit. Another definition of cost is it is the money that that a successful party gets in a lawsuit. For those of us who know a bit about law, for example, when you and I have a court case, and part of our agreement before we entered into that agreement is that if we have to go to court for whatever reason, and you breach the components or the contract clauses, you will be responsible for the cost of my litigation against you. So if you take me to court, or I take you to and you lose, somebody's going to bear the cost. Lawyers are in the house, they understand what I'm talking about. 
That's why judges will award compensation, even for all the court costs. They say, because you made this man to suffer this cost for breaching the contents of your contract, go and pay him for the cost of making him to come to court, to drag you to court. So, cost tells us about what we will have to give or what we will have to lose, what we will have to suffer. It's the same thing that Jesus was talking about there, about how we will have to be a disciple. That is a cost for being a disciple. Beyond the blessings of God that the Lord can pour out onto us as his people, there is a cost. Many times we don't talk about the cost. We talk about the benefits that can accrue. But no, people of God, there can never be benefits where there are no costs. Where there is no benefit, where there is no cost, we can have the benefit. Something has to give for something to happen. Something has to be suffered. Something has to be lost. Oh yes, we will say Jesus paid all the price. He died on the cross of Calvary so that we can gain salvation. It cost him his own life. It cost him his blood. And I wrote a few examples here. That is the cost of building a business. So if you are in business this morning, there's a cost. Number one is that the size of your capacity will be equal to your business. If you have a small capacity, for example, you will have a small business. Small capacity. The man who runs the corner shop somewhere around there selling cigar and peppermint, the level of his capacity is what he's sitting on. It's not costing him much. But the man who has open shop rights, not too far away from there, is costing me, him a whole lot. In fact, if he has not taken, he has mortgaged his entire life. He has borrowed a lot of money. Some of them have sold their houses. Some of them have, they are just in debt. Any big man you see walking all over town, some of the big names you mentioned, they are owing to pieces. They are owing all the banks in the world. Some are not even owing in Nigeria. They are owing in France. They are owing in America. They are owing everybody. Some are also public quotas companies. They borrowed money from the shareholders to put money into the business. That is the cost. That is the cost. So, to grow as an individual, that is the cost of growth. Where you lack capacity, in fact, I remember a particular person that I used to be in the same church with. He was trying to grow his business, but he had problem with estimation. He doesn't know how to determine the cost of the production he wants to do. Those who are in production here, they will understand what I'm talking about. He's a furniture maker. Every time he wants to do a job for you, for example, he gives you a quote, which is supposed to be the cost of the job. But I realized that he doesn't know how to do estimation. So when he has started the job and he gets midway, he's never able to complete any contract. He has problem. Many times he's put in police custody. I have to go there or tell one of the pastors in church to go and bail him out. So when we see what happens, we realize that he does not understand how to do estimation. What is the, he knows the job. He's a fantastic carpentry man who will do a lot of nice work. But he doesn't understand how to determine the cost of the work to be done. So if the work will cost 10 million naira, he will put a quotation of 5 million naira. And then he's in trouble. He has bought all the wood. He's doing everything. The machines are running. He's paying daily worker whatever money they need. But he doesn't have his, uh, he can't even finish the job. And the man says, no. And you know people who price people to, to death. The thing they know is supposed to be 10 million. But they know that this man is a mogun. They price him to 5 million. Ah, oh, no, I cannot pay. And the man says, I need the job. He will collect. He can't finish. That is the example that Jesus was giving there. He said, how can you build a tower when you can't understand the cost? How can you build a big business when you don't understand the cost? What does it take? What do I need to grow my capacity to respond to the type of growth I am looking at? What does it cost? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Of what? It is knowledge of the cost. What does it take to do what I have to do? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of, of what? Is the cost. What am I going to do to get what I am looking for? Where do I need to go? What effort must I put in to get what I'm looking for? He said, Because thou hast rejected knowledge, God says, I will reject thee. Customers will reject that. Not only God. Even the men of this world, they will reject such an individual. Not knowledgeable about how to sow and how to reap. Not understanding the law of investment will make you to remain very, very small. Um, example number two, that is the cost of building a great marriage and family. There is a cost. You want to have a great family? There is a cost to it. To be a great wife, there is a cost to it. 
There is a big cost behind it for that matter. One fellow sang one song. I'm sure you've heard the song. He was trying to compare between a woman and a lady. How many of you know that song? If you, if you call a woman, African woman, no go Greek, you say I'm a lady. How many of you have heard that song before? You have heard it now. Are you not living in Lagos? <laughs> you have heard it before. So don't pretend you haven't heard it. That is the cost of being a lady or being a woman. The real women know that you cannot be a lady and a woman at the same time. They pay at, the lady doesn't want to do anything. She paints the finger. She pulls the gogoro shoe and then she's just busy posing up and down. Husband is at home, he has not eaten. Children are back on school, nobody pays attention to their assignment. Of course, sometimes people, people like you have, who are in the 21st century, you have a nice way of marrying both together. Eh? But some of the time, you have to tend more to becoming the woman who will take care of the husband, take care of the extended family if there's a need to. Go and visit grand, grand husband of your husband or grandpa of your husband if there's a need. But the lady will say, mm, uh, uh, that me and my wife, and uh, me and my husband. You will never have a great marriage that way. There is a cost. There is a cost. I was listening to one competition on television some time ago, and I saw a young, some young boys they call them memory masters. Memory masters. Even if it's a 20 page document, they can store everything in their head and regurgitate it effortlessly. Small young boys. And each time they ask them a question, they refer to their mother. So, how did you become like this that you can, you can bring things back the same way you have been taught three, four days ago? He said, Mommy will take cane on one hand and put it here. And it's ensuring that you have to read over and over. Sometimes the mother has also crammed those things and they are singing them together with those boys as if they are lullaby. Some songs that people will sing in the night before they go and sleep. Daddies are not there in most of those cases, but the mommies are there to ensure that. Some of the time they say, it's my grandmother, so somebody has paid the cost for them to become whatever it is they have to become. There's a cost of being a great husband. There's a cost. You can choose to be with a wife and family or to be a man who is gallivanting with other women all over the place. You cannot build a great family. Like, there's a cost. There's a cost. In your career, there's a cost. There's a cost that you have to bear for you to arrive at the top. People don't just arrive there. There is a sacrifice that they have had to make before they show up there. If connection takes you up there, it cannot keep you there. I'm sure you know. Many of you get job through connection. I know so-so person, I know so-so person. They will give you the job some of the time. That is in some organization where politics is the other of the day. In some other organization, you go and fight for your own share of whatever happens there. So even if something takes you there, if woman power, but power takes you there, something will have to help you to keep it. There is a cost that you have to bear. There is a cost for a great marriage. There is a cost for a great business. There is a cost for being a great dad or a great mom. There is a cost for being a great student. There's a cost. You will have to read, you will have to write an exam, several of them, because you cannot inherit your father's certificate. I'm sure you know. I have several certificates now. By the grace of God, I, I, I've gone to a bit of uh, many schools. But it doesn't matter how much I can bequeath to my children in terms of money, house. I can't give them a certificate. I'm sure you know. Everybody will have to go and read for his own and pass. You have to read. If your father was a professor before he died, the day he dies, the certificate is ended. It can't be used. So, even if you say, I am sick, I'm not feeling well today, I'm not going to go to school. Eh? When you get well, you come and write your exam. You don't go to school now, eh? no problem. You know some people, when it's exam time, one week, they say, I am very sick, I have leg pain, they say, no problem. You will miss the exam, you will stay in the hospital. When you come back, you come and write your exam. There is a cost that you have to personally bear to become whatever it is that God wants to become. That is a cost. Nothing good will come the way of a believer without you paying the cost for it. Oh yes, you say grace is sufficient. And I, I guess the same grace is available for the general pastor, but he goes inside the bush some of the time to pray. I thought somebody can sleep on his bed and say grace is sufficient. But he says, sometimes I go into the bush to go and pray. There is even no light there. I have to blink my eye to find or I'm carrying my touch light and my walking stick in the night and my dog is following me all around in the, in the camp. I was wondering if that was supposed to be necessary if grace is available. But grace is available, right? But the man is still doing something. So that distinguished him from the rest of the crowd that you may be finding elsewhere in the world. 
that is a cost. Tell your neighbor this morning that is a cost to pay. That is a cost to being a great pastor. All the men of God here will agree. That is a cost. That is a cost. You have to be ready to read your Bible and pray endlessly for the people. You have to be ready to visit the hospital when members are sick. You have to do naming ceremony even if it's not convenient for you. You have to do burial when people die. Don't say, I'm a pastor, I don't bury people. Ah, you, they have not died. When they die, you go and bury them. I remember that I've had to bury somebody. Husband was there. Wife was the one who died. And two or three other people were there. Family said, oh no, we don't, there's nothing we can do. She has died. And we, we don't have money for any ceremony just to make sure that you take care of her. And what can the pastor do? You cannot say today, I'm only a naming ceremony pastor. I'm not burying anybody. There's nothing you can say. That is a cost because you have chosen to walk in that path. That is a sacrifice that you have to make. Whether it is convenient for you or not, there is a cost. There is a cost for being a great pastor. Your life will be put to the serious test before you can be what God wants you to do. That is a cost of being a Christian. That is a cost for being a disciple of Jesus. It takes a lifetime to be a great Christian. And that's where I'm going this morning. What is the cost? It takes a whole of your life from the beginning to the end to be a child of God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It takes consecration. It takes separation of yourself from the crowd. And I try to define Christianity in a few ways this morning. Please listen to this. Christianity is believing that you serve a God who will never forget your labor of love and reward you in this season. I'm trying to define it here. Please follow me. Christianity is believing that you serve a God who will never forget your labor of love and he will reward you in this season. Have you ever given advice to people? They got their breakthrough and you failed and you refused to be bitter. But God better with your service to God. Let me repeat that a little while. One more time. You have given advice to people. They are doing well. You that gave the advice, you are not doing well. And you refuse to be bitter. That's Christianity. It's a cost. I gave you advice. You know, some of the time, pastors give very good advice to people. This is what you must do. This, and they are doing well. And you are not. You can't figure out your own life. And you refuse to be bitter. Because what derails many people in the course of this journey is that we now start wondering, so why does God do it? Why will he do it for him? I will not do it for, him, for me. A Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, he will not be bitter even when you have prayed for others, they got their breakthrough and you didn't get yours. Have you ever prayed for people, they got healing and you are still carrying your own sickness and you are not bitter. That's Christianity. You prayed for people, they got their own healing. You didn't get your own and you refused to be bitter. That's what it means to be a Christian. Have you ever prayed for people, they got pregnant and you are still waiting on God and you refuse to question God and ask him whether he's still alive. You prayed for people, get your own baby, receive your testimony now. They got, you can get. That's Christianity. That's the real Christianity I'm talking about. Not that, God, if you are not going to do it then, I'm not going to serve you anymore. There are people who have walked away from the way of faith because they felt that God has been unkind or unfaithful to them. Have you ever prayed for people's job to be kept and you lost your own job? And you refuse to cry and curse God. That's Christianity. One man in the Bible helps us to, to put all of this together in Job chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. Job chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. He helps us to define Christianity, even though he didn't call it Christianity. But listen to what is, what is done here. Job, Job chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but saved his life. So when Satan fought from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore balls from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself without. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain your integrity in the midst of all the trouble that you are going through? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. He said, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of the God? the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Look at the conclusion of that scripture. He said, in all this, did not Job sin with his lips? That is Christianity. 
Because everything is not going to work as perfectly as you have planned it. All the money and resources you want to see happen, it doesn't matter how hard you pray, that everything will fit together as a puzzle. And this is the fundamental truth that you must take with you this morning. It is not a Matthew chapter 5 sermon. This is the core of Christianity that the Lord has called us to preach. Look at, look at a few things. What are the costs of following Christ? As I try to conclude this morning. What will be the cost of following Christ in 2019? Number one is the determination to be unequally yoked with the works of unrighteousness. The determination. What will it cost you this year? What will your Christianity cost you? What is the price you have to pay for Christianity or serving the Lord for being a disciple? Number one is to be determined to be unequally yoked with the work of unrighteousness. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 17. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 17. He said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship would, has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17. He said, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. And when we began to break this down using all the methods of theology, he said, come out from among them and be ye separate. He didn't say be ye separated. Uh -huh. He didn't say be separate. He said be separate. Be different. That's what he said. Even though you are in the world, but you cannot be of the world. You are. You are not going to go to another school if you are a student that I mentioned before. You will be in this school, but you'll be separate. You'll be distinct and be noticeable as a Christian. You'll be a woman that looks like any other woman, face looking nice, good gilly on your head, but you are separate from the rest of the women who are other women around the world. He said, come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The grace to be separate this morning from the rest of the crowd of this world, receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What is the second cause? Number two is self-denial of the trappings of sin and pleasure. You have to be able to deny yourself what is the way that the world is flocking into? What is the excitement that the world is finding in sin? That's why we fast. is to deny ourselves from the trappings, the enticements, the things of the world that can trap a man. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 25. Then Jesus said unto the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Of what? Of the things that give him pleasure. So if a man can't fast this money, it's because he can't deny his belly of food. If a man can't pray, he can't deny his eyes of sleep. He says, take up your cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, you want to save your life? You're going to lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake, said he shall find it. Self-denial of the trappings of sin and pleasure. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin shall not have power to hold you down. It means you have power to tell that sin. No more. 2019, I'm not part of this. I'm not going to be part of this. You are going to take a very strong and firm decision to say no more to the trappings of sin. Psalm 19 verse 13. Look at David's prayer in Psalm 19 verse 13. He said, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Don't let sin have dominion over me. Don't let me be a slave to sin that is tossed back and forth. By 2019, I should be matured enough as a believer to stand against certain things and let the people know that this is not my own path. I'm not in this with you. I'm not going to be shy or deceive myself because many people are there and refuse to say no to what I should say no to. 
Even when we were young children, we were growing up, and our parents were speaking to us, they say, whatever you need to say, no. Don't say yes there. That's also applicable here this morning. How are you going to deny yourself of the things that have given you pleasure and they are sinful unto God? A good example you'll find in the Bible is the story of Joseph in Genesis 39. Genesis 39, verse 7 to 10. That's a story you know very well. Even when Potiphar's wife tried to entice him with what appeared a temporary pleasure, the man said, no. He said, no. Who would have known if the man had said yes? Maybe Potiphar may never have known. May never. How many sins have you committed this morning that people have never had? How many? There are things that you and I have done that people don't know. But there is one who knows. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And don't forget the definition I gave to you of a man who is called, is, 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 is believing that there is a God who is a rewarder. That's the definition I gave you a few minutes ago. Even when men don't know, there is a God who knows. That man will have stayed there as a slave boy in Potiphar's house forever. And his destiny may never have been fulfilled. There is something that sin does to us. It cuts us from the big plan of God. That's what it does. Everyone who lives in sin, what it's doing inadvertently is that you are using your own hand to delay or to short circuit or to cut off whatever it is that God has in mind. It doesn't matter how prosperous you may be appearing at the initial stage, but there is a deep, because there is, the Bible says there is nothing that is hidden that will not be brought into the open. Imagine if it were brought to the open that Joseph was sleeping with Potiphar's wife. Try and imagine what would have happened. Very likely, if it was possible for Mordecai or Haman to be looking for how to cut the head of uh, Mordecai, that would have happened to him. And his destiny would have been truncated. I pray for somebody who is there this morning. The grace for self-denial in 2019. Receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What is the third cost? The third cost. What will Christianity cost you this year? Is to have a sense of stewardship of all that God has given unto you. Whatever it is you have, you do not own it. God gave you as a steward, as a custodian. You must have a sense of custodianship that what I have belongs unto God. Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 10, verse 21 to 25. Mark, Mark chapter 10, 21 to 25. Mark 10. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross, and follow me. The Bible says, and he was sad. Many people are sad in the church because they are not recognizing that what you have in your pocket is, a, is, a, is an item that has been given to you to steward over, to, to have custody of. Many people argue in church and fight over money because they think that they have a right to appropriate whatever resources that come. Whatever it is that is in your hand, from the example of this rich man who became sad, the Bible says he went away, grieved, for he had great possession. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. It is easier because money is a deceiver. Money deceives you. It makes you think that you know more than the pastor. It makes you think that you know more. You know there are people that when they have money in the church, you can't talk to them. They think you are talking nonsense. Yeah. You have just told them what God is saying per time for that particular time. He says because you don't have money, that's why you're talking like that. Because you don't have education more than me, that's why you're talking like that. He said, how hard will it be? God wants us to know that whatever it is we have, we are custodians of it for him. It will cost you your money this year. It will cost you your resources this year for you to serve God diligently. So whatever it is you are doing before, if you will move to the next ladder in God's kingdom, there must be a change of level, even in sacrificing that which he has committed into your hands. Somebody say amen this morning. Amen. Number four, what is the cost of your discipleship of following Jesus in 2019? It is the capacity to bear inconvenience and insults. Capacity to bear inconvenience. 
A Christian is a man who bears inconvenience. He's a man who bears insult. You will walk into a place and you expect them to honor you and give you respect. They don't care about you. Must he hurt you, therefore, and get angry and walk away and get out of the meeting and say, because you didn't give me my due respect, I'm out of here. They are not a Christian. Somebody needs to tell you. And there are people who do that now. They get angry and they bang the table and they start fighting with people because you think that somebody didn't give you your due honor. Christianity is that even when you have been taking one mile, you go two miles with them. The one scripture says even if they give you one blow on the face, you may have to turn the other. It, the meaning of that in simple terms, even if you will not put your face for somebody to start decking you and deck you to a hospital, the meaning of that in you know, in simple terms is that you will have to be able to bear inconveniences and insult. You, you have to be temperate in your behavior because your patience will be tested this year to the extreme. Your patience will be tested. Your wife will test your patience this year. Your husband will test your patience this year. I'm sure you know, some of you have been tested before. Uh, there are many of us who, are, who understand the formula of how to handle problems like this. Even though if your patience is tested, what do you do? Some of you just sit down in your house and you're, not, you're, you're just watching football and you're using that to cool off. Some of you take your bag and get into your car. I have seen people who get into their car in anger and they go and perish. I'm sure you have seen it before. Somebody just gets angry. Is it me you're talking to? La, la, la. He will not punch his wife in anger because they have told him uh, a real man does not fight with women. You've heard that before. And he says, no, I'm a real man. Therefore, I'm not going to punch my wife. But it's also a stupid man because he gets into his car he drives to kill himself. Both ways he loses. He loses. But how are you going to contain and be able to be temperate in your behavior? Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 5, 30 to 39. Matthew 5, 30 to 39. He said, you have heard it. It's been said before. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Verse 39 or verse 40. And if a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him take, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twin. What's Jesus speaking about? You will have to have capacity to retain, to take insult, to blow it away, to say it does not matter. So that you can have your peace as a believer. So that you can have peace with all men. Otherwise, you will hit your head against everybody and you lose out completely. There are many people who are living, living miserable lives today because they don't know how to, be temp to, to maintain their temperament. They hit head against this. They hit with that. They hit with the choir. They hit with the minister. They hit with the elders. And then they say, everybody hates me. Who hates you? You hate yourself because you don't understand what the scripture is saying. There are many husbands who say their wife hates them. But it's because they can't maintain the right temperament. There are those who can't survive in some of the workplaces where you work now, where salary is paid, and you are looking for another job. When in that same job, God has a big plan for you to take you to the top, but you are not broken. You are not broken. You think, everybody should be under me. Why should they be under you? Everybody should refer to me as the boss. Does it, does it, does it matter? God is saying to you in 2019, you will have, the, you have to have the capacity to bear inconvenience and insults that may come. It is in that insult that God is taking you somewhere. I pray for you this morning. Whatever it is that is making you temperamental and to, to blow out and to bust out unnecessarily, that spirit is taken out of your life this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. As I close this morning, Jesus paid the highest cost, the sacrifice of his earthly life, the shedding of his own blood. He paid the highest cost. You have not even Fought, you have not resisted the devil up to your blood and your body. You have not. First Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 19. He said, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, he said, But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Four things that sin will take away from you if you refuse to take this course. Number one, it will take your fellowship with God. It will deny you of your assignment with God. It will take God's provision away from you. And finally, it will take your eternity away. Four things that the sin, 
that your hands may be found in in 2019 will take away. I repeat myself for the sake of emphasis. It takes your fellowship away. You will not be able to wake up in the morning and pray to God again. Gradually, that man is going. Sin takes our fellowship away from God. Sin takes our assignment. If I live in sin perpetually, I won't be able to come and preach to you. It's a question of time. He goes, your assignment will go. You will not be able to stay there and sing. You will not be able to stay there. You won't stand there. Gradually, you have a good reason not to come. And you are happy not to come. Your assignment has been taken away from you. Sin pulls the man away from the place of his assignment. That's what sin does. Number three, God's provision cannot be made available to a man who lives in sin. You can get your resources from other places, but not from God. It takes his provision away from you. And most importantly, it takes eternity away. And the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He said, what shall a man use in exchange for his own soul? The, Jesus, when he made that statement, he didn't put an answer before it. He left it for you and I to decide. He said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He said, what shall a man use in exchange for his own soul? Answer the question yourself. The meaning of that is that that is nothing. That is nothing greater than your soul before God. It is not the money. It is not your wife. So when we go back to the scripture where we started from, he said, if you don't hate your wife, you don't hate your husband, you don't hate your brethren, and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Can we close our eyes and speak to God this morning? Do we really want to be his disciple? Are we willing to pay the cost? Are we willing to pay the price? This is a year for the believer who is ready to be his disciple wholeheartedly. Not only the one who is looking for the blessings of God. That is asking for favor. Favor only. It's not a message on the mount only. There is a cost that you have to carry, that you have to bear. Why don't you ask God to help you this morning? To carry the cost to pay the price that I have to pay to be a great disciple of Jesus. Lord, show me, show me. Why is my life difficult? Why is my journey not producing the right result? Why am I stressed up? Why is my ministry not growing as it should? Why am I not functioning at my best in my workplace? What is the cost that I must pay? You must come the cost. Where there is no cost, there cannot be benefit. I don't you ask God this morning. By the power that is in the blood of Jesus, I receive the grace. Lord, to serve, to pay the price, to pay the price. You have paid the ultimate price for me. What do I need to do to make my marriage better? What do I need to do to make this church better? Is sin taking my assignments away from me? Is it taking my fellowship away from me? Is sin about to take your provision away from me. Is sin struggling with my eternity. You are not going to profit anything if you gain everything and you lose your soul. Why don't you ask God this morning? Lord, help me, Jesus. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me, Jesus. Somebody speak to God this morning. As you are thinking, you should also pray. Don't just think without praying. Ask God for help this morning. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, prepare me a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true we first give all be a living sanctuary And I will not prepare me. Lord, prepare me. I send you a ring. Pure and holy. Try and choose. Oh, with thanksgiving. Oh, I'll be a living.
this morning he wants to surrender his life unto Jesus. You want to love him more than you love your wife, your husband, things of this world. You just want to surrender unto him. Why don't you wave your hand wherever that you are seated this morning? You want to carry your cross and follow him. You want to shun the works of darkness, the works of sin. You want a restoration from all that have taken away your fellowship, your relationship, your provision, and it's about to take away your eternity. If you are there this morning, I want to pray with you. This is a prayer you must pray. Thank you, my brother, whose hands are lifted there. If there are other people, can I see your hand? I just want to pray for you this morning. You want a restoration. This is a morning of restoration. And for those of you who are watching us online, why don't you pray also together with us and ask the Lord to help you. Lord, please help me this morning. For those whose hands are lifted, please rise up on your feet. Just rise up on your feet this morning. Rise up boldly in the place of grace this morning. And ask the Lord to help you. Help you. Help you. Let there be a restoration of your fellowship back unto Jesus. Nothing will take the place of Jesus from you. Not your wife. Your wife can't save you. Your husband can't save you. They are temporary helpers for your destiny. Only Jesus can save you and heal you and deliver you and grant you eternity. Not your husband, not your wife, not the pastor. It is Jesus. So if you are rising up, you are rising up for Jesus this morning. Those of you who are rising up, just say after me, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me this morning. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I have come to you today by the power that is in your blood. Wash me and make me whole again. I confess with my mouth that you are the Lord over my life. Grant me grace to walk with you from now till eternity. Thank you for my for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Just take note of our brothers. Baba is there to receive the two of you and just to pray in addition with both of you. And if there are other people who would like to come and join them, please come. The rest of us can rise up on our feet as we pray. The rest of us can rise up on our feet as we pray. Just stretch your hand to the altar this morning. Lord, as I pray for your people, just stretch your hands to the altar. Lord, there is a cause to carry. Your grace has procured all that is needed. But there is a role we have to play to enjoy the benefit of that which you have done. And for everyone who has been struggling one way or the other, we're not paying the price, so we're not enjoying the benefits. We're not willing to serve. We're not willing to put down our ego. We're not willing to put down our resources. We're not willing to put down our body, soul, and spirit to love you with the entirety of our being. Lord, today is the day that you have asked us to speak to your people that there is a cost to pay. And for everyone who desires to pay the price this morning, Lord, let your grace be released in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, for us to walk with you from now till eternity. Give us the grace to carry our cross and follow you in the name of Jesus Christ. Let nothing in this world stop us anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. For everyone whose marriages are sick, unhealthy, there is a healing in the house this morning. Lord, let your healing power flow to your people in the name of Jesus Christ. For those whose businesses are failed woefully and they are wondering what is the next thing to do. Lord, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that by the power that is in the blood that changes everything, that makes us whole, let these businesses be revived today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So people's ministries are dead. I'm asking in the name of Jesus. Sin has taken our place of assignment, has taken us away from our assignment place. For those who may be here this morning, let there be a restoration this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Release your fresh grace upon your people in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, eternity is what we have in mind. Take us there in the name of Jesus Christ. Whether we like it or not, Lord, take us there in the name of Jesus Christ. We will not die in our sinful life in the name of Jesus. We receive the grace to carry our cross and follow you to the end in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for answered prayer. Blessed be God forevermore. And when the roll call shall be reeled out in heaven, we will not be missing that in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Someone say better. Amen.
Hallelujah.